Hello there, Pink Dev talking. So GDQuest now has a four developers team working together to create tutorials. And when you reach this level of teamwork, you start to have a growing need for a guideline to follow so people can communicate better their work and their workflow. In this video, I will explain to you the GDQuest code guidelines so you can follow them when you are contributing to GDQuest projects. I'm with the A Star Movement project opened here. It was done by Resvan and I will use it as an example of how to follow the guidelines. So let's open the script workspace here. I have three classes open and let's start with this actor class here. So quite simply, you start with the extends keyword followed by the class that this script extends. So the, the base class of this script. So we know what will be available to us besides the custom methods that will be inside this specific class. So we know what it is extending. After that, you can optionally add the class name keyword followed by a unique class name. But this sh should only happen if you want other classes to have auto completion for this class methods. So if you want another class to use this class on its implementation or if you want to make some type checking so you can add a new class a custom class to make type checking and filter what you want to work with of course that if you are working with a tool script you would have the tool keyword on the top of the script here as well so this is the order of the keywords here the tool keyword if you are working with a tool script this is not the case the extends keyword if you are working with a an extension of a base class and the class name keyword followed by an unique ID only if you want other classes to have auto completion for this class methods or properties. And also another good case for having this class name keyword. Uh, let me go to this to the workspace here is if you want to have it on the create new node menu. So we have here the actor if you want to right back to the script workspace. So this is the order of the keywords on the top of the script. This, these are the, the first keywords that you should add. After that, we add a doc string. So a doc string is a long string that will be used as a documentation tool for your script, for your class. Inside this doc string, we add a brief description of the class followed by a long description, so an in-depth description of this class, and also we add some notes. So notes are anything that is important to know or that is good to know about this class, but it's not related to its implementation or to its intention, so not related to the actual description of the class itself. So you can see there are some good informations about what will happen in the runtime, so at runtime the tree will become something like this, because it is implicit in this class that we, it will have a no operation behavior inside of that. So these are some good information that we will have to avoid some errors or some misleading thoughts. So after the doc string explaining what this class does and the problem that it solves, uh, allow me to go to this events script here. This events script is a design pattern that Resvan designed. He will make a video explaining it, but it's not important for the purpose of this video. But the important thing to know about this is that after we have the doc strings, we start to add the signals. This is because signals is the easiest way we can get data and pass data using a class. So uh, it's the easiest way to communicate uh, information between one class to another. This is why it's good to have them on the top of the script so we know the events that this class communicate and what are the data that we can get easily from inside this class without having to access the properties or calling any methods. Now regarding the signals naming, we have two major concerns. You should always use the past tense. So if this uh, ended with just walker, so party member walked. And you should always append the started and finished words for signals that are chronological related. So if a signal is emitted on the starting of a processing, uh, you add the started word. But if a signal is emitted on the ending of a processing, you add the finished word. Another thing related to the naming of these signals is that if they are not meant to pass data, so if they are meant to only communicate an event, you shouldn't add anything after the name of the signals, not even the, the parentheses. Uh, because we can add the parentheses here and simply leave it blank, 
you can actually leave it like this normally, but this goes against the guidelines, the GDQuest guidelines. So if there are nothing inside the parentheses, you can leave it without them, like this. Now, after the signals, uh, let me go to this game script here, we add the onReady variables. This is because these onReady variables are usually used to communicate the dependencies of this node. So if we go back to the scene here, I'll turn off the description free mode, this game script will use the board and the party nodes. So if you go back to the script, I'll turn on the discretion free mode again. We have this communicated right on the top of this script. So these are the dependencies of this script, what it will use inside of its method. And we should be aware of these dependencies if we want to reuse this script. After the onReady variables, we add the constants. And note that when naming constants, we follow the all caps snake case convention. So constant, all caps, snake, case. So all letters shall be capitalized and any space should be written as an underscore. After the constants, we add the enumerators. So we don't have one here, but I will create an one just for the sake of this video. So enum and enumerators naming follow the camel case convention. So every word it starts with a capitalized letter. So uh, example of enum name and the content of this enumerator shall follow the constant naming as well. So all caps snake case. So it's the same convention for the constants. This is because the content of the enumerator are constants as well. After the enumerators, we add the exported variables. Uh, the reason for this specific order, so constants followed by enums followed by the exported variables, is that we can use enumerators as type hints for the editors. So we can use the example enumerator for a variable. So let's say example var, it will be the first index of this enumerator by default. And inside the enumerators, we can use constants as its content. So we can use, for instance, the draw of set draw color draw with it as the content of this enumerator and in the editor so i will go to this to the workspace here we can use this exported variable to select which of these constants will be used as its value going back to the script if we try to declare this first so if i move it to the top here this will not be possible because the example enumerator is not declared before this variable. So this is the, the reason behind this order here. So constants, enumerators, and then exported variables. After the exported variables, we start to add the public variables followed by the private or pseudo private variables. And note that we follow the snake case naming. So all words are lower cased and they are separated by underscore. And note that for pseudo private variables, we prepend the underscore as well to communicate through this uh, static hint that this variable is private. Since Godot doesn't have actual private variables, we use this static hint to communicate that this is supposed to be private, so you are not supposed to work with that from outside this class. And note that for variables that alter the state of the class or that trigger some behavior, we encapsulate them through setters and getters. And when naming functions, we also follow the all lower snake case convention. So we use the same naming convention for variables and for functions or methods. And as well, if this method is supposed to be private, we prepend the underscore. And note that for all setters and getters that encapsulate private variables, they are supposed to be private as well. So we always prepend the underscore for setters and getters that are encapsulating the private variable. Now, after all that, uh, let me go down here. After all that, we start by adding the good old building virtual function. So ready, process, input methods, draw, everything that is related to any of the good old building functions. And note that we always separate each function block. So if I open here, you can see that we have two blank lines between each function because this will help us identify better or identify quicker when does a function start and when a function ends. Now, after the declaration of all the virtual methods that you will use in your script, you can start creating your public functions. And note that for all public functions, we give type hints for the arguments and we also give type hints 
for the returning value of this function. So in the case of prepare path, it will return a value of type array. And in the case of the party command, the message argument is of type dictionary. This is because in GDQuest, we favor the static typing. So GDScript static typing, you can check out the video of overview of the static typing in GDScript. We have this on the channel already. And we favor static typing in our code guidelines. So if you want to contribute to GDQuest projects, you should use static typing. And also you can add, if needed, a comment on the top of your function to describe what it does. As you can see, in Rasban case here, we have quite a pollution of comments. Uh, this is not always good. If you have a lot of comments, this can be a sign that you didn't make a self-documented code. It cannot be the case of, of Rasban. He made a very good and readable code, but he also had a lot of comments. And we'll see in the next video why comments is not always a good thing to have in your script. So you should avoid them whenever possible and make your code speak by itself. Now, after the declaration of the public functions and the implementation of the public functions, we add the signals callbacks. Uh, on the top here, we have this on signal callback. It seems like it is a signal callback. So uh, this should be on the bottom after the declaration of all the public functions. So I will leave two blank lines here and I will throw this after the public functions. So after this members walk function here, I will leave it two blank lines, paste it and another blank line on the bottom here. I will fold this. Now regarding the naming convention for signals callbacks, we follow the good old convention. So we add on followed by the class name or the node name. In this case, this seems like a generic callback for events from the event class. So on events signal. And we also add the name of the signal, but seems like this is a generic callback for any signal of this class here. So I will leave it like this. And going back to this event class here, if we were creating a callback for a specific signal, so let's say this encounter probit, we would create a function with the following name. So function on events encounter probit, and then we add the argument followed by its type. In this case, it would be a dictionary. And then we add the returning of this method, but in most cases, a signal callback is just a void function, so in this case, void. And this is the, the naming convention for signals callback. So we add on, followed by the class or the node name, and then the signal name, exactly like it is declared after the signal keyword. There is a small twist though for signals callback from the class itself. So let's say we were creating a signal callback for this encounter probit inside the events class we will take rid of this. We will leave it just on, followed by the name of the signal, and we would omit the class name or the node name. Now I'll take rid of this, and I will go back to this game script here. So on the party command, you can see that it is a void function. I will open this to show you another guideline that we have. So you can use the return keyword when you are using it as a safeguard mechanism. So if this block right here down after the, the return is not supposed to run if a given condition is not met. So in this case, we have this condition here. And if this is not met, we will return and this won't happen. This return, the safeguard mechanism should only happen on the beginning of the function. You should not use it on the middle of the function. And for any returns, so even if this return any value, you should not add it on the middle of the function. You should add it on the beginning or at the end. So let me go down here on a function that actually returns a value. So we can see this prepared path here. And you can see that we have a path. And by default, it, it is a empty array. And at the end, we add the return of this value. So it can change in the middle of the function but at the end we return it. So uh, for instance, we could return it here, but following this guideline, we don't do that. We don't return any value at the middle of a function. So this sums up the guidelines for the cut structure. So the sequence of the variables declaration, the methods, etc., and how we use the keywords in our code. So when they happen. 
In the next videos on the, these guidelines, we will talk about good practice using static typing, avoid no, and avoiding also unnecessary commenting. That's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and until the next time.